You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. We're also going to talk about motivation, and that is really the theme today, because it's not about the setback, but the comeback. We're going to tell you how to overcome adversity, how to build teams, and how to have an exceptional workforce. Welcome to Convenience Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard with Nax. And I'm Carolyn Schneer with Nax. And today we're joined by phone with Robin Benacasa. She is a multi-titled world champion adventurer, racer, motivational speaker, founder of the project Athena Foundation, and San Diego firefighter, and I might add, Nax Show General Session speaker. Welcome, Robin. Woohoo! And Hi, a co- and of course, uh, your your voice you mentioned uh, before we came on the air is a little hoarse. You've been uh, already involved in in activities today, whooping it up, and uh, just coming back from a, an adventure in, um, in the Grand Canyon. Yes. Oh my gosh, it was awesome. Um, every year we take a group of survivors and fundraisers to do a rim to rim to rim crossing in the Grand Canyon where we hike all the way across in one day and out the other side and then all the way back the next day. So it's 45 miles in two days. And, um, you know, it's kind of all about all of us helping survivors live an adventurous dream as part of their recovery. And it's, uh, it's a a huge comeback party. So they can show their doctors and their families and themselves how strong they are, you know, after a big setback in their life. And, uh, it's just an honor to, you know, to lead those trips and to be a part of it. And, uh, it actually all kind of stemmed from a, a miniature setback I had and kind of turned it into something for other people, you know, as a way of, of dealing with it. And, uh, I'm telling you, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Like everybody who's involved with Project Athena, um, you know, this organization, uh, it's just an amazing family and there's so much love and there's so much goodness and there's so much people helping people and a great team that we all come together and do this thing together every year. And, uh, maybe, maybe some of you guys who are listening will come with me next year. You never know. That, that sounds fun. I love being outdoors and doing cool stuff. Although if I go for like a, a short run for me, it's like four miles and I'm like complaining about it. I've probably complained about it three times today. I don't know, 45, it'd take me at least a month of, of complaining about that one. But um, one of the things I want to do- You can get, complain. <laughs> you just have to keep going. <laughs> it'd be bragging. It'd be bragging at that point. <laughs> um, so you started out in adventure racing. Um, and I'm just curious, I've, I've read your bio, but for some of our listeners, um, starting out in adventure racing, starting out doing all the really cool things that you did- um, and and still do, but how did it get you to where you are right now, where you're motivationally speaking, but also um, with the Project Athena, which you referenced just before, too? Uh, so, you know, in essence, it actually happened literally how adventure racing got me into speaking, because I, I never imagined being a speaker ever, ever, ever in my life. It never crossed my mind. And then, um, gosh, about 15, oh, gosh, more than 15 years ago now, uh, Fast Company Magazine actually decided to do an article called Extreme Teamwork, where they studied the world's most consistently high-performing teams, like our adventure racing team and a team from NASA and a team from Industrial Light and Magic and, you know, from different walks of life and people that work in these crazy, difficult, constantly changing situations as a team to see, um, you know, what they can learn from us and apply to fast-moving companies, fast-moving businesses. And I guess the article was really popular, you know, because it was unique and interesting and a different way of looking at teamwork and leadership. And uh, they wanted one of our team members to come speak at a reader conference. And, like, literally, I drew the short straw on my team. I was, like, the newest member of the team, and they made me go do it. And I just, I mean, I swear, I thought I was going to die before I went on stage. And I was like, I just created this whole program called the Essential Elements of Human Synergy. You know, how we're better together than anybody could ever be alone. And used some examples from adventure racing and, and told, you know, those stories about how our team and other teams just succeeded against the toughest of odds. We never would be able to do it alone, but with this team and, and what we create together and capitalizing on each other's strengths and everybody leaving your ego at the start line. And, and, you know, when, when you create that environment, like what you, you know, the outcomes you can create for your team. So I guess it was a popular uh, keynote at the 
at the reader conference for Fast Company, and I was super lucky that there was a zone vice president in the audience that day from Starbucks. And he came up to me right after and said, oh my gosh, do you work for Starbucks? Do you know people that work for Starbucks? Because this is exactly what we want every store manager to know and understand and kind of what we know about creating exceptional experiences for our customers. And um, suddenly I was on this 15 city tour going to talk to all the Starbucks managers, you know, on, on half of the country. And, um, and it was amazing. I was scared to death, but I loved it. And I loved how inspired people were by the adventure racing stories. And, you know, certainly adventure racing is nothing that anybody actually wants to do. <laughs> it's not really smart. Unless <laughs> you're being and, chased you know, by a bear or something. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's, but, you know, there's just so many lessons that come from it. And that's what I, that's what I love to share. And I think when most people think of adventure racing, there, most people think about, somebody just solitary, um, putting in the hours, running, swimming, whatever it is, but it's a solitary event. And, and really adventure racing, the, the way that you've been involved in is, is the opposite. It involves making sure people are together and, uh, you don't succeed as an individual, you succeed as a team. Can you talk a little bit about the whole concept of adventure racing um, and, and how it differs than I think what most people think of when they think of yeah. very extensive, grueling activities? Yeah, and I actually came from that world before, and so I, that's how I knew the shift that happened within me going from being a total soloist, like doing the, a lot of triathlons and Ironman races and kind of being an indi- individual athlete my whole life. And then I kind of got addicted to to this sport and and the parameters of it. Adventure racing is actually um, a titling of a very particular sort of sport where um, you kind of you have small teams. You have to have one man and one woman on each team, and it's it's from three to five people depending on the rules. And they there's a race director who kind of says, "Hey, meet me on this mountain in Tibet on this day, or the middle of the jungle in Fiji, or or you know on this open field in Borneo on this particular day." And and they give you a bunch of maps and compasses and road rules. And and the next morning they basically say, "Ready, set, go." We'll see you guys in 600 to 1,000 miles through these 30 to 40 checkpoints. You're navigating your your own way the entire time, so there's no GPS. You know, you're looking at maps using compasses. You don't have to use any prescribed route. You know, that's part of the game is is the route that you that you choose and the interesting thing part about the sport though is that in the rules it says every single person has to remain within 50 yards of each other from start to finish and so it's not like a relay or it's not like if one person leaves it's okay i mean if one person on your team quits or is injured and is out of the race your entire team is disqualified so what it basically forced us to learn was you know, how to genuinely deeply care for everyone around you. And that was not just a nicey, nice thing. You know, when you create that environment and you have that empathy and awareness of each other um, to the extent that I know I can't cross the finish line without you. So we really got to take care of each other. And, and what we learned is basically how to get a group of semi-exhausted people through an endless series of checkpoints in search of a nearly impossible goal, working against extreme time pressures and constantly changing conditions and the goal of doing it among the best and the best in the world. And wow. like what I said to a group of people, they're like, well, that's what I do every day. Well, that's like <laughs> Jeff and my morning. We get up and we, you know, have coffee at work. And um, yeah, sometimes it's we like, that, like fight totally for paper different. at the copier machine, yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it's but really like it is like, as a leader of the business, it is your life, you know. It's like we have all these crazy deadlines. That things are constantly changing. We have a million different checkpoints to get to. And we want to do it better than anybody else in the world. You know, and, and so that in that in that way I actually kinda of say, you know, I know nobody here wants to be an adventure racer, but with what you guys every do every single day. You're an adventure racer every day of your lives, you know. Especially leading, you know, leading a convenience store team or, or you know, multiple stores or your your supplier I and mean, it really applies to every single uh person who who interacts with another human being. Like how do I create this environment where the the, the people I'm encountering every single day are we're gonna be better together in terms of our outcomes than anyone could ever be alone. And and that's what I kind of share and teach, like how do we create that in term what you know in terms of who we bring to the table every day, the team builder that we bring. So uh one thing before we get into some of the dynamics that that involve um why Fast Company was so interested in adventure racing and why it's so important, uh, I had mentioned at the outset that um it's not the setback, it's the comeback. So 
tell us how the comeback fits into your story. Um, so I would go along and do my thing and being a fighter fighter and being an adventure racer and having a great time. And, and, uh, then in the world championships in Scotland, I kind of like, I literally like ran out of power, but just in one leg, like one leg would no longer come forward. And it was crazy. And I uh, basically kind of hit the deck. My team picked me up. They, they tucked my pack off me, put me on the tow line. And, you know, for the next three days, I like physically had to move my legs forward, you know, manually with my hand or with the, mm. whatever, whatever I could come up with, you know, with the <laughs> bandanas and things like holding on to moving my legs forward. And I went home and what I discovered was that I was literally at the end stages of osteoarthritis in one of my hips and, and, and cartilage was all gone. And on the other side, I was pretty close. And I went from like being like a totally healthy endurance athlete to like, you're never going to run again. And Oh, by the way, you need two hip replacements. And, you know, it was pretty shocking, uh, you know, at the time to kind of understand that I was probably never going to really run again or race at that level again. You know, we had sponsors, we had commitments. And so I had to really kind of, as quickly as I could process all that stuff. And I was on an operating table like three weeks later. And, um, and since then, yada, 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 I've actually had six hip replacements. Don't get me started. Mm. But, um, after, after the first one, um, I kind of had to step like a little talk with myself. Like, okay. You know, what are you going to do with this? You know, like you're constantly talking about how you got to deal with challenge and change. Now, what are you going to do? And I thought, well, you know, I have all this background in adventure and I love sharing out with people. And, um, and I actually took my setback of these hip replacements and made my own comeback in a whole nother sport in paddling. So I thought, you know what, maybe I can take that concept of, you know, like I did for myself, like saying, Hey, it's not about, you know, your setback it's about your comeback. What are you going to do with this and do this for other people? And, and that's how Project Athena was born. Um, I thought, well, you know, maybe we can take survivors of medical or traumatic setbacks and help them live an adventurous dream as part of their recovery. And, you know, and, you know it's about you showing the world how awesome you are after a big setback. And um, Project Athena was born about 10 years ago, and it's a small little, like, volunteer labor of love for all of us. And um, it's just, like, some of my semi-broken adventure racer friends and I, um, we, we train people, you know, survivors and fundraisers, by the way, um, we train people to, for four months before an adventure, and then we take people on adventures like that rim to rim to rim we talked about in the Grand Canyon. We also do a kayak and bike ride from Key Largo to Key West. So people ride bikes and kayak 120 miles down the Florida Keys in another one of our adventures. Uh, we do a through hike across Zion. We hike a 26.2 mile marathon in San Diego. And it's really neat because the format matches what I talk about in my keynote, which is we all stay together. Like everyone that comes on these adventures, all the survivors and, and fundraisers, they all stay together the entire time and take care of each other and carry each other's pack and feed each other. And it's really a neat, um, you know, it's a neat little circle of love that we create on all these adventures. And, uh, and then everyone goes back in the world and throws a tow line to somebody else and helps somebody else. Um, you know, with, with their challenges in their life. And um, so it's a neat little like kind of pebble that we put in the pond and, and, the, and the ripples uh, have gone all over the world now. So it's pretty cool. That is really cool. And I know um, I, I race too, not fast. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not breaking any records. I'm barely even uh, in the top half. But when I, when I run, I mean, there was one time I was running along and it was, a, I don't know, 10 mile or whatever. I'm right at the end. And my knee just like gives out and it just like hurt. Mm. So yeah, I'm like literally like holding it, not to the same extent of yours, but I'm, and, and you know what? Some guy comes like walking up next to me. He goes, you are not stopping. The finish line is there. Let's go. And he like literally like grabbed my arm and, and convinced me to go. But then other people, it's just like a racing community, but it's just a community around you of people saying, encouraging you to continue to keep going. And I find that in any of the races I do, it's, you know, there's, even if you stop for a second, you're going up a hill and it hurts. They're like, just keep going. Just, you got this. Come on, what, let's go. And, yeah. and then you find yourself doing it to the next person who slows down. And right. and it's such an encouragement that, you know, in this case, I could see, you know, having to stay together. I've never raced with people next to me that I have to stay with the whole time, but I mean, it's it's fun and it's it's interesting and it does play into your your work community. And I mean, we all work in situations one place or another where you just have to grab each other, sit down and just talk and get through the situation together. And it, it usually it usually works out. Right, Jeff? That's right. <laughs> um, one of the things I yeah, saw. And it's also oh, go on. You know, uh, like 
it's also about capitalizing on each, on each other's strengths too. And, and knowing that you don't always have to be the strong one. Like you have your area of strength, like, you know, mind with strategy and feeding people and getting the sponsors and, uh, and paddling. And, and then, you know, some of the other guys were better at, at navigating and running. And like when it was your strong suit, you're the person that helped others and you're the person that, that carried more weight or the person that, that towed, that towed people behind you. Like we actually had little strings. We would actually tow each other, like literally tow each other, uh, like through the course. And, you know, and then when you're not in your area of strength, your job is to like facilitate the success of everyone else around you. So you're constantly thinking like, what else can I do? Who else can I help? What else can I do? Who else can I help? And it's that kind of neat circle of, of strengths and challenges that everybody shares. And I think in a corporate world, you know, we, we all like to share our strengths and we all love that. But I think we have a problem with sharing our challenges. And when you have a level of trust with your teammates that you create as a leader, you know, sharing your challenges becomes, becomes natural. And, and you realize that that circle is going to go around and around. Like someday you're going to be the challenge one. The next day it's going to be your buddy who's the challenge one. And when everybody jumps in and helps whoever is having those challenges at the moment, you know, everybody rises, you know, the organization rises, the store rises. And, you know, it's that culture that you create. And, uh, and I really learned that from the guys that I raced with because I went in as a total soloist and I had to learn what, it, what it's like to leave your ego at the start line and be a real teammate. Yeah, now that's a great point because I think when most people think of, well, hide your weaknesses because hide your challenges because if if somebody sees that you have a weakness that you you're not able to finish something, then they'll replace you. Um, it, it's not like that though. It's important Mm-mm. for everybody to understand, and, and I think that's one of the biggest business lessons that people learn along the way is it's okay to be vulnerable. And it's okay to let people know this is where I need help because I trust you and we're all part of a team. This is not this is not a, a zero sum game. We all win together. And I think that's yeah. one of the most important lessons that we can pull out of adventure racing. Yeah, and, and then we always said in our team, like, you know, grabbing a toy line isn't a weakness, it's how you win. I mean, and we won, you know, probably in the sport, we won probably in, in the industry of sport, we're probably still one of the top three teams in terms of the number of world championships and big races won over the years. And, you know, and every single race, one of us was on a toe line for almost all of it. It wasn't always the same person. <laughs> you know, it just depended on, on the situation at the moment, who was most awake and who was dehydrated, who was sick or who was stronger at what sport. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't a weakness. It was like, Hey, let's not wait for this person. Let's just take them with us. And that made way more sense to us. And we sort of started that whole revolution of not just walking side by side towards the finish line, like a lot of the teams do, like we do in the real world. Um, we're like, why would we just walk side by side when we can, you know, push, pull, tug, toe, carry, you know, and inspire each other? Like, that's the way to do this. And, you know, and that's how we started winning. Like, we were never the best athletes, but we were the best team you know, almost, almost every single time. And it's sort of like we lived by that Vince Lombardi quote that, you know, the secret is to play less as individuals and more as a team. You know, as a coach, you play not your 11 best, but your best 11. Mm, And your best 11 is always going to be better than your 11 best as soloists. So how do you take that? um, Because that's, that's an incredible thought. I'm just processing that in my head right now but how do you um take that mindset and and get a team started so say you're a you're an owner of a convenience store or a a regional manager and you have several different uh stores under working for you or with you so how do you inspire that team to be able like what's your advice toward to them well first of all it starts with you as as the leader i mean period in the story like you set the culture you set how things are, you set the stage for how we react and respond and relate to one another, you know, in this organization. And so culture, you're the leader of culture, but that doesn't mean you always have to be the leader in in general. You know, there's that big difference between management and leadership and, you know, in your capacity as a manager, you're always going to be a facilitator of all of your team members' success. That will always be your job. You know, you, you run your stores, you make it work. Um, you know, you set the hours, you do, you do a management role, but you don't always have to be the leader. And in fact, one of the things that makes your team really strong, um, one of the essential elements of, of human synergy and, and, and extreme performance is kinetic leadership, meaning 
you know, let leadership change based on strengths. Like sometimes you may have a newest, the newest person in your organization, but they have this great background and experience in, for example, uh, social media. You know, you're, you're, you're bringing in somebody who's, who's just grown up with social media. It's something you're not strong in. If you try to lead that area and tell that person what to do, you've missed a huge opportunity to let somebody lead in their strengths. And when people lead in their strengths, they rise to the occasion. They feel like an engagement of the team has this ownership. You believe in them, and that creates the mutual respect. And you know, so, so I created actually these, these eight essential elements of, of human synergy and extreme performance. And it's actually an acronym for teamwork. And over the years, it's completely stood the test of time. So it was based on our team. But also having spoken, you know, to a hundred companies a year, you know, major companies about their teamwork and hearing their challenges. And I mean, it applies to every single team and you're like, it applies to marriage. It applies to everything. And, and these eight essential elements of, of great teamwork and human synergy are, um, they're like, uh, I, I kind of like refer to it like the spine. They're like vertebrae. And, and if one is out of alignment, um, your, your team is not functional. You know, your team is not as functional as it could be. And so your job as a leader is to take each of these eight, eight essential elements and constantly analyze, is my team like totally committed to the finish line? Do we have a plan, purpose, perseverance, preparation? Um, you know, how do I demonstrate it? How do I inspire it? Uh, then, then the E, it's actually an acting for teamwork, you know, these eight essential elements. It's empathy and awareness, um, you know, connecting to the person before the point and realizing that people don't work for your company, they work for you. And so your empathy and awareness of them as a human being and not just a worker is huge. Um, adversity management, you know, how you handle challenge and change is the A in teamwork and, and you know, being ruled by the hope of success versus the fear of failure and kind of how you, how you approach difficult challenges and seeing challenges instead of roadblocks and, and not letting the pursuit of perfection hinder progress and all these things we talk about in my, in my presentation. And then mutual respect is the M. Um, we thinking and how great leaders are constantly thinking, speaking, acting as we, accepting success and failure as we, um, you know, creating that ownership that, yes, we succeeded, you know, in, in terms of our numbers this year, we succeeded, or we, we didn't succeed. You know, there's never that finger pointing. There's always that completely inclusive we as, as a group. And I talk about how to create that. And then ownership of the project, ownership buy-in and engagement. Everyone has to own the outcomes, own the finish line, own their role, and relinquishment of ego is the R, and that's a toughie. Um, we always say uh, everybody has to leave your ego at the start line because it's the heaviest thing in their pack, and that's 100% true. The teams that didn't finish were the teams where they'd have someone struggling who wouldn't give up their pack, wouldn't accept help from each other, um, and had to do it themselves, and, and you know, their just ego was so wrapped around the axle that they weren't seeing the bigger picture of the team's success instead of them keeping their own ego intact. So everybody on a great team has to leave their ego at the start line. And then kinetic leadership, which we kind of just talked about, like changing leaders and changing leadership styles as a leader and being that leader that your teammates need in that moment and being able to kind of shape shift, you know, as a leader. Like sometimes there's that tough love and laying down the law. And then sometimes, you know, there's that, that visionary kind of leader. And sometimes there's the firm and sometimes there's the coach. Sometimes there's a democracy. Um, you know, and, and knowing who to be in that moment. And if you have those eight essential elements lined up on your team, um, you're golden. I mean, it's, it's, it's magic. And if everybody knows and deeply understands them and lives by them, you know, you're going to have you know, incredible synergy in your organization and your results will show it. Yeah, I really love the concept of the last of those eight, the kinetic leadership and how you can move from point to point to point. And the leader is not necessarily the person that's always the leader and how that moves around. Um, so, Robin, how can people learn more about your teamwork uh, philosophy and also more about Project Athena? So um, my website, and you can like, see the eight essential elements of my content, uh, a lot of videos there. I have a lot of videos under my name on, on YouTube as well with great content. Uh, but my website is um, worldclassteams.com, or, or my name. They both point to the same place. And, um, and Project Athena is projectathena.org. Well, thank you for inspiring us today. I think this advice is perfect for your existing teams and have, how they can grow. It's also for how you build new teams and when people are looking for jobs, how do you inspire them and tell them they're part of something bigger and part of that team? 
Thank you, Robin, for joining us. It's been great talking with you. And thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.